Let me share my screen. Okay, do you see it? Yes. Okay. Uh, so, so today's lecture and hands-on session is all about uh, uh, the application of Bayesian inference uh, in heaven collisions. And the hands-on session will mostly focus on the inference of the QGP medium parameters. And tomorrow, Raymond will have another lecture covering uh, the physics of jets. And uh, I think most of the Bayesian uh, methodology and uh, some of the machine learning tools that is uh, used repeatedly in this type of uh, study it has been introduced in uh, uh, Simon and uh, Aaron's talk yesterday. So today is more like a, how to apply this uh, techniques in a, in a real world problem. And we will try to first understand where are the origins of the uncertainties in this multi-stage uh, jetscape simulation of the QGP medium and understand what's the why, why the, 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 how, how, how do we choose the, the prior distribution and how to apply those uh, like um, machine learning techniques to analysis this uh, uh, complex models. And finally, we'll talk about uh, how do you validate that your results, it's uh, basically this entire work, 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 workflow is reasonable and what you can improve in the future. Okay. Uh, So the high energy uh, nuclear collisions, what we call little bang, actually has a, a lot of similarities in the problem of the big bang. In both cases, we are trying to infer both the dynamics of the medium as well as the initial conditions. So in both cases, uh, initial conditions and the dynamics are, are both unknown and we try to uh, uh, extract this information simultaneously by comparing series and experiments. And in the past decades, uh, in our field, we, we have really started to see this shift of the paradigm in asking questions like this. Uh, basically, if you don't know your initial condition and don't know the exact input of your uh, uh, dynamics with so many unknowns, how do we draw statistically robust conclusion from the data? And we have seen that uh, uh, the Bayesian <clears throat> methodology is uh, a very powerful framework to answer these several questions. For, <clears throat> for example, we want to uh, extract the <clears throat> distribution of some parameters, and you have a, a prior belief on what this uh, <clears throat> pra parameter distribution looks like, and then you can compare the model calculation with the experimental data and update your knowledge on the distribution of these parameters. And in this process, we want to distinguish two types of parameters. One is the uh, interested parameters. For example, the, the, the primary quantity that we want to extract from analysis. For example, in this case, we are primarily interested in the shear and bulk viscosities of the QGP. And to get this distributions of interested parameters, we will integrate over the uh, what we call the nuisance parameters. Those parameters are uh, not interested not interested at this time, but they are of course an essential part of the model. And although they may not be well, well, well very well constrained, but we have to propagate their uncertainties into the understanding of the interested parameters by the so-called marginalization procedure, where we just integrate over uh, the nuisance parameters to get the final posterior for the interested one. And this uh, is a very powerful tool. It actually helps us answer a lot of questions that uh, there's no way that we can uh, uh, answer in, in the past. Uh, still taking this uh, uh, shear viscosity uh, of the QGP as an example, from 2000 to 2004, there are either weakly coupled or strongly coupled approach that provide you the bulk, the bulk part of what uh, the QGP shear viscosity uh, maybe like uh, from, 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 from one over four pi all the way up to uh, outer one quantities. And then starting from 2006 uh, and ongoing, there are start use the phenological extractions with physical hydrodynamics 
So you are starting to extract these numbers from experiments, and you gradually find that maybe this value is uh, eta over s is about one to two. Oh, sorry, there's over four pi here. One one over four pi to two over four pi. And from 2013, uh, people start to use the Bayesian analysis and to propagate uncertainties from, uh, for example, both initial conditions and each of the modeling stage, and to try to constrain more uh, uh, statistically robustly the eta over s, the equation of state, and also the initial conditions themselves. And after that, you can use this approach to ask more detailed questions, like what is the temperature dependencies of the shear and bulk viscosity? Can we uh, really constrain them from the experimental data? And later, we have also been applied this to heavy flavor, diffusion coefficient, and later to the jet sectors. And right now, we uh, what we are really focusing on is, is try to refine the models and workflow and introduce more statistical uh, uh, methods like Bayesian model averaging uh, to, to, to <laughs> to take into account a more general uh, class of uh, model uncertainties. And there are also other groups try to use more differential observables to see what, uh, what, what type of new information we can learn from the data. And this is a, a collage of uh, things that we have been able to extract or constrain using the Bayesian methodology, like the QCD equation of state. Uh, the QGP viscosities, and this uh, more recent Jetscape uh, work, extracting shear and bulk viscosity, which will try to reproduce part of these results in the hands-on session. Uh, the heavy quark diffusion coefficients, Jetscape uh, recent extraction of the jet transport coefficients, and I think in the Hanji community, they also start to use this method to extract the pattern densities. Okay, for the Rest of the talk, we will first uh, try to identify all the source of uncertainties in our multi-stage uh, bulk medium model, and then use the Bayesian analysis workflow uh, and build the Bayesian analysis workflow to, 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 to study such a complex model. And finally, we will go over some of the results of the Jetscape extraction of shear and bulk viscosities. Uh, so, so part of this has already been covered in uh, last week's uh, lectures. Uh, for example, essentially the hydrodynamics and the transport model has uh, the part the hydronic transport model has been devoted to separate lectures. So here I will just go over this uh, entire framework quickly and uh, also talk about the, for example, the initial condition model that is not uh, covered too much uh, before. So the first stage of the Jetscape uh, simulation of, QG, uh, of nuclear collisions is a initial energy deposition model. We call it, uh, we, we use the Trento model to do this. So in this stage, its time scale is very short, especially when you have a highly boosted nucleus colliding together. The collision process basically happens in no time. And in this case, we'll simply neglect any uh, dynamics within the nucleus and directly deposit energy according to uh, the density di distribution of the two incoming nuclei. In this case, we are uh, parameterizing the energy deposition near the middle acuity as a local function of the uh, nuclear thickness function. The nuclear thickness here, we uh, specifically we mean you integrate the participant nucleus density along the z directions. And because this time is so, so short, you can neglect any transverse dynamics. That's why we parameterize energy deposition as only a transversely local function of the two thickness function. Of course, the exact way of how this energy deposition happens is still a, a quite a complicated problem. And right now we don't have a, a very prevailing uh, first principle uh, answers to this. But we can prioritize a class of uh, energy deposition formula. And first of all, this will try to in incorporate some, some degree of initial condition uncertainties in the extraction of shear and bulk viscosities. And secondly, we can also try to see if the experimental data can actually constrain the initial condition or not. 
So in this case, this prompt relation in Trento is that you raise the one nuclear thickness function to the power of p plus the other nuclear thickness function to another power of p and take the average and take the one over p's power. So this is also called the generalized average of the two quantities. Uh, this may seem quite arbitrary, but it actually reproduces some of the uh, widely used models on the market. Like if you take p equals to one, this energy deposition formula is just the uh, wooded nuclear model, which is the energy deposition proportional to the sum of the thickness function. If you take p equals to zero, uh, in the in this limit, it's actually proportional to the square root of t a t e. If you expand this thing in, in p. And such a scaling is very close to a saturation-based EKRT model. So here you can con con compare what this generalized mean uh, formula, how it scales with one of the uh, uh, nuclear thickness and compare to the actual uh, other uh, models of uh, what the model predicts. And if you take P approximately equals to minus uh, two third, its scaling properties is very close to another saturation-based model is the KLN model. So, so P is just a way that we, we not only uh, reduce this to some of the scalings of certain models, but also we can take continuously how this energy deposition uncertainties enters the whole simulation. The second stage, stage is the pre-equilibrium dynamics, what we call the free streaming. So, so in this stage, the system is driven by very fast longitudinal expansion. And to first order approximation, you will neglect any relaxation time scale. And in this case, you can, you can evolve the energy momentum tensor of the medium by a, collisional, a collisionless Boltzmann equation. Uh, because there's no collision, essentially you are just free streaming the energy density from one point to another with the speed of light. The effect is that it will smear out the Trento initial condition at uh, a, a given at time zero. And this uh, free streaming time scale, tau fs, is a parameter that we consider before this time scale. We can neglect any relaxation. And after that, uh, the system becomes uh, strongly interacting. And we use the hydrodynamics to, to describe its evolution. The free streaming time scale is also a quite complicated problem because it certainly is a time scale. So it certainly depends on, well, it depends on the characteristic energy density of an event. So that's how we parameterize the uncertainties in how this free streaming time scale changes with the uh, energy density. So we use this uh, power law form. There is a characteristic time scale. And then depending on the uh, average energy density of the uh, event, you can either have a, a free streaming time growth, uh, a growing with energy density or decreasing. Uh, of course, uh, you may think that uh, by, by dimensional argument, uh, the hotter and more and more dense the system is, maybe the, the onset of hydrodynamics will, will become earlier. But uh, in this case, we just don't want to exclude the other possible cases and to see if this argument can be verified from the data. And the third stage is the most important stage of this entire uh, framework is the viscous hydrodynamics. It's very important because it directly takes those inputs that uh, what we're really interested in as, uh, as inputs, such as the QGP equation of state, and the shear and bulk viscosity, which enters over here. Oh, by the way, can you see my cursor on the screen? Oh, uh, never mind. Uh, so, so this stage is this uh, pressure-driven hydrodynamic expansion, and it uh, it will generate the uh, uh, quite. Uh, Importantly, the 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 the, the uh, flow harmonics that directly probes the magnitude of shear and bulk viscosities, and uh, for details of hydrodynamics, you can review the pace lecture uh, last week. Here are just two examples to show 
how are the hydrodynamic stage provides us the sensitivity to study uh, the shear viscosity and bulk viscosity. So you start with the same initial conditions, you run the hydrodynamics with a ideal setup, setting viscosity to zero on the top row, or with a finite viscosity on the uh, lower, uh, uh, on, on the second row. At least visually, you, if you look at the space-time evolution, you, you, you notice that the effect of viscosity is that it will smear out those very sharp edges or fine structures during your evolution. Uh, in terms of actual observables, they will correspond to the details of the uh, azimuth anisotropies, such as over, uh, on, on, on the right, you can see how the change of viscosities uh, affects mean PT or the second order, uh, third order, and fourth order harmonic flows. So in this case, it doesn't change the mean PT so much, but definitely that you have a, a, a huge sensitivities uh, to viscosities from uh, the harmonic flows. On the other hand, if you change the bulk viscosities and uh, uh, keep the shear viscosity unchanged, you'll see that it will primarily change the mean PT and maybe a, 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 a relatively small effect in the harmonic flows. Uh, of course, uh, this is how uh, in, in, in the early days, people tried to do eyeball fits and to extract the value of uh, shear and bulk viscosities from, for example, mean PT and uh, the, 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 the ultimusal uh, uh, momentum anisotropies. But with the Bayesian uh, analysis, we can really combine not only just these two observables, but uh, a lot of other uh, observables like uh, hydron chemistries and uh, multiplicity uh, fluctuations and also more intricate uh, correlation observables uh, to do a global analysis to extract shear and bulk viscosities. So after hydrodynamics, there is another stage that due to the expansion of the system, the temperature drops quickly. And when you get close to the pseudocritical point, there is a rapid change of degree of freedom. So basically the system suddenly becomes a more hydron like and less dense in terms of uh, uh, particle densities or the interaction rates. And at some point, the hydrodynamic expansion start to break down. And in this case, we will do what we call the particleization procedure. That is basically you convert the energy momentum tensor described by the hydrodynamics into hydron species, uh, hydron ensembles. That is the distribution of hydrons for every species, including space-time and momentum information. Of course, you only have 10 quantities over here, but you have to have a distribution for every species of hydrons. And there's a clearly a, a loss of information. So there's no unique way to perform this uh, conversion from T mu nu to this distribution function. So that's why this is, this is another a huge source of uncertainty that can, can arise in our models. And because we don't have a unique way of converting T menu back into uh, distributions, our strategy is that we will, uh, we will consider several models on the market that uh, based on different assumptions to try to reconstruct uh, distribution functions from T menu and try to marginalize over these different model choices on certain things. So this is not a continuous vary of some parameters like in the initial condition stage, but you have uh, three or four uh, choices of model uh, with different assumptions and you try to uh, see which one is, first of all, which one is performed by the experiment data. And second, if they are uh, have equal importance, how do you combine the results to arrive at a more robust uncertainties that take into account all of these uh, different model assumptions. And this is, is what we will, uh, we will show at the very end using the uh, Bayesian model averaging to try to marginalize over this discrete, discrete type of model choice uncertainty. So right now we are mainly uh, 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 testing three types of models. There are the uh, grad 40 moment expansion, which says that uh, the viscous correction to the distribution function 
can be expanded into powers of uh, momentum and uh, basically uh, uh, expansion in in in, in this uh, bilinear of momentum. And the second one is the first order Chapman Unskog solution to the single time scale RTA Boltzmann equation. So we're assuming that at this uh, conversion stage, the hydronic system can be described by RTA Boltzmann equations, and you try to match its solution to give the correct uh, energy moment momentum tensor from the hydrodynamic stage. The third one uh, is a nonlinear uh, model where, in order to match the T mu nu, you try to deform, you have you can see there's a transformation matrix uh, of the momentum uh, according to uh, the, 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 the the shear tensor and the rescaling of the temperature uh, according to the block pressure. You try to deform the equilibrium distribution so that you can reproduce the uh, non-equilibrium uh, energy momentum, momentum tensor. So here you don't have to focus on details but what you can see is that all of these approaches based on different assumptions really gives you very different uh, momentum and temperature dependencies. And this is what we want to test it and marginalize in our uh, model. Okay, I see there's a question on Slack. So the question is that, uh, in the initial condition model, the reduced thickness is interpreted as energy density, but on the slides from uh, JS Moreland, it's entropy density. Is there a motivation to use energy instead of entropy? Okay, so 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 uh, so when when we develop Trento initial conditions, there is no really no uh, motivation of what this quantity is. Uh, this is because this is just the ansatz that try to convert initial condition uh, two fields from the initial condition to final states. Uh, you, you can say it's entropy density or energy density, and there's no way that one is better than another because, of course, this is a parameterization itself. The reason that uh, it is originally interpreted entropy density is that we don't have this free streaming stage. And what we have to do is that you assume that the system uh, already thermalized at the very beginning. And so that we, we can define the entropy. That's why in earlier works, we, intro, uh, we introduced this frontal ansatz as entropy density. But later we have included this uh, free streaming stage. And the free streaming stage is a direct evolution of T mu nu. And in this case, we have to initialize, in this case, the energy, energy component of T at the very beginning. And that's why we use Trento as the energy density. For initialization, but but deep down, there's no particular reason that why this quantity should be interpreted as one or another. It's just the answers to convert each condition field into the field after the collision. Okay. Okay. So the last stage of this uh, model is the, the the hydronic transport phase, modeled by the the smart transport equation. A uh, smash transport model, which has also been covered in detailed lectures last week, and this will just uh, <clears throat> describe how those uh, uh, hydrons interact in this uh, dilute phase of hydron hydronic system. Of course, such a model also has a huge number of parameters, but these cross sections of hydron uh, hyd hydronic collisions has already been been fixed. In, 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 in describing other important quantities like how, how the cross sections evolves with beam energies, uh, there's no parameters that will be varied during the, the smash phase. Okay, so all we talk about before are what we call the known uncertainties is that we know we're we're, we are uncertain about the modeling of this uh, dynamics. There are another a part of uncertainty is the unknown uncertainties, which is also we can, we can call it the model imperfections. For example, even though you have a uh, viscous hydrodynamic model, uh, there is no guarantee that uh, you can describe all the systems with the hydrodynamic uh, signal hydrodynamics with without any <coughs> uncertainties. Uh, as a more simple examples, you can think about in this in this way. So, for example, we want to extract the parameters 
using the very simple linear model. You go on with trust intercept and the slope. But the ground truth of nature is actually a series of expansions. And by using this model, you are certainly uh, omitting some of the higher order terms, which can be small, but, but they are always there, right? So in this case, when you try to extract A and B of a nature that looks like this, using a model that looks like this, you certainly get some uncertainties by omitting these high order terms, what we, is what we call model imperfections. So this type of problem is generally more harder, uh, it's harder to, 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 to analyze. It's because it's very hard to parameterize something you don't know what it looks like. So there are two types of solutions that I can think of right now. One, uh, also uh, practiced in some of the earlier works, is to try to guess the level of imperfections and try to marginalize over the, uh, these parameters. So in this case, you assume that the, for every model calculations, there's an additional relative uncertainties associated to that predictions. And you assume that uh, this uncertainty level will also have uh, some prior distributions. And then you include this as another parameters and try to marginalize it just like other parameters in the Bayesian uh, framework. Another solution is of course, try to keep improving models. For example, if you keep improving models and start to include it's uh, uh, square terms in, in the model, then definitely you are reducing your more imperfections and also reducing this uh, unknown uncertainties. Okay, that's the, the first part. Uh, the second part is that uh, uh, how we uh, build a Bayesian analysis workflow to study such a complex model. So here by complex model, it mean, means that you have uh, <clears throat> both nonlinear uh, <clears throat> nonlinear observable response to the parameters. You have a high dimensional space of the input parameter space, high dimensional output, output like more than 100 data points at uh, led, led at 2.76 TV alone. And in the future, you can in include more and more systems and colliding energies. So high dimensional input and output. And this is also, also computationally intensive because in order to evaluate observables at a single set of parameters, you need to run other thousands or sometimes for more intricate observables, uh, maybe 10,000 uh, events per input point. And each of these events will take about one CPU hours for two plus one D hydrodynamics. And this is certainly a very time consuming process. So we really need to improve uh, this most direct, naive workflow of Bayesian analysis in order to, to study this uh, very computationally intensive models. So conceptually, what you need for Bayesian analysis is that you start with uh, a input parameter space and some prior knowledge. And you, you, you need to have the ability to evaluate the model prediction at any of your interested parameter points and try to compare the experiments, measurements, and your predictions using the Bayesian theorem and to define a posterior. And then you may have uh, some other uh, techniques to explore these posteriors. And when you have a very high dimensional problem, uh, we will have to essentially in this stage that uh, uh, at an arbitrary input point uh, to, to generate the model predictions uh, with vanishing amount of time, we will have to borrow some of the, the tools from machine learning, like a model emulator and data reductions uh, covered in Aaron's and Simmons lecture to, uh, yesterday. And finally, to explore this uh, high dimensional posteriors, we will use probably this MCMC techniques to draw samples from the posterior. Okay, so the first uh, improvement by using the machine learning techniques is that uh, we don't have to always uh, run the full model to generate model predictions. Instead, we can only run the finite set of model predictions on a design space. So the design space is just you, 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 you choose carefully a finite set of parameters in the parameter space and run the full models. 
and then try to build this model emulators that give you a fast interpolation from any input space to predictions. This interpolation is done by the Gaussian process emulators, which is also covered yesterday, but here I want to just, just give you a simple example of uh, uh, how, how does it look, uh, what, what the Gaussian process emulator looks like. <clears throat> so a Gaussian process is just a multivariate Gaussian. For example, you have a 2D Gaussian with zero mean and the covariance matrix that uh, looks like this, which means that uh, you are uh, having two variables, one and two. They are, they are positively correlated, but when they are far apart, you have some degree of uh, decorrelations. So if you plot variable one and variable two with the indexes, with the index as the x variables, you're actually parameterizing a bunch of uh, random uh, uh, linear segments from uh, drawing this, this from drawing samples of this 2D uh, Gaussian emulator, uh, 2D Gaussian distributions. And now you can repeat this problem for three variables or uh, with a covariance matrix that looks like this. So this means that uh, uh, if you are differed by one indices, you still have certain correlations, but if you are differed by two indices, there's no correlations. So in this case, you get this, uh, uh, piecewise linear uh, uh, distributions by, by pulling samples from the 3D Gaussians. You can do it for five, and you can do it for more and more. For example, this is the, the uh, pull samples from the 20-dimensional Gaussian with zero mean. And in this case, uh, you can write down a general formula for the covariance matrix, key, uh, keeping the essential idea is that uh, you have stronger correlations when the inputs are closer, and they decorrelate when the inputs are far apart. So in this case, by drawing this uh, high dimensional Gaussian distributions, you are basically generating smooth random functions uh, from <coughs> uh, 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 some, some domain of input and output, output. Of course, random functions are not so useful. What is useful are the condition or constrained uh, random functions. So in this case, for example, I want to mimic a function that will give you uh, zero at input three, give you 0.5 at input 11, and give you output minus 0.6 at input 16. And of course, this data may have some uncertainties. So all I need to do is just take those random functions and only plot those random functions that pass through these constraints. And in this case, you have a bunch of, uh, a, a bundle of curves, and this bundle, including its spread, will be your interpolating functions. So for example, you want to ask, what is the output at input eight? I can say that on average is about 0.5, but you will have uncertainty ranging from uh, maybe 0.2 to one. So, so that's essentially how the Gaussian process emulator works. Of course, in reality, it's defined with a more mathematically uh, uh, rigorous formulas, but but uh, here I just show how this constraint will provide you a interpolating functions using the uh, Gaussian random functions. And you can do it for 1D functions. In this case, it's just some uh, simple examples. You can also, we will not cover this in today's hands-on, but I think uh, you will find a, a Python notebook uh, uh, that, that it, it exactly helps you generate a plot like this. So in this case, you have a truth function and you have a data observation of the truth with some uncertainties. And then you can use the Gaussian process emulator to try to interpolate the data. And you will, you will notice that we've seen uh, the range of the, the input as probed by the data, you actually get a quite good uh, inference on the tr uh, on the actual true functions with a certain level of uncertainties. Uh, you can also test it for two-dimensional functions. It also works pretty well. So in this case, on the left, you have the the truth uh, is this two D surface with uh, some some training data sampled from the truth, and on the right, you have the Gaussian process interpolation. 
and um, bottom left, you can see the relative uncertainties <coughs> of uh, Gaussian emulator's prediction versus the ground truth. So, so it works in both one-dimensional, two-dimensional, and it's, there's very easy, easy generalizations to higher dimensions. Okay, so the ducks will uh, kind of uh, solve the problems of uh, uh, running very in, uh, uh, time consuming models is that now you, instead of evaluating the parameters at every input point of the parameter space, all you need to do is to evaluate the final set of points. In our case, we'll evaluate about 500 points in the uh, uh, in the parameter space and then try to use emulators. The second problem is that uh, the model predicts uh, not just one observables, but a high dimensional vector of output, including, for example, the multiplicities of pi on, chi on protons, uh, transverse energies, the mean PT of uh, pi KP, uh, charged particle multiplicities V2, V3, V4, and you can also have, uh, I think we'll also include the mean PT fluctuations. So in this case, of course, you can build a uh, one individual Gaussian emulator to emulate each of these quantities, but this is both inefficient and sometimes can be, uh, uh, can even be, be completely un undoable. Uh, as I have, uh, I think I've told you that uh, even at uh, 2.76 TVs, you have uh, over a hundred observable points. And if you include also other systems that will double, at least double these numbers. And for tomorrow's lectures, if you focus on jet observables, you have another dimension of uh, transverse momentum, which makes the number of output growth uh, exponential really. So, so in this case, we need the better uh, techniques to model this vector of vector like output. And this comes to the dimensional reduction via the principal component analysis. Again, I think this has been discussed yesterday, but here I just to mention what uh, the PCA is, is doing in our uh, in our models. So, so the PCA is a way to use the empirical correlations in the data. So by empirical correlations that when you vary the, the model parameters uh, in a very wide range, you'll start to notice that not all observables changes independently. For example, if you change the initial energy density normalization parameters, then it will certainly increase the multiplicity of the pi and the kind of proton produced in a single event. And since you have more particles produced, the number of transverse energies and the number of charged particles will also have to increase. So this group of observables kind of, uh, they, 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 they change in, in a way that is positively correlated. On the other hand, if you increase, for example, viscosities, they will decrease all the flow uh, harmonics, V2 and V3 and V4. So you, you, you know that by changing viscosity parameters, these three numbers are not completely changing independently. They have certain correlations with them. And uh, there are also like, uh, so these are, are two examples uh, that the change is uh, positive correlated. You also have changes that are, that are negative, negatively correlated. For example, if you give the same amount of, of initial energy from the initial condition, and you change some other parameters that increases the number of particles. And because the total energy is the same, if you increase the number of particles, the average energy of the particle has to decrease. So you have uh, all of these uh, useful correlations that you can use. So instead of model every independent observables independently, the PCA will provide you a systematic way of organizing uh, these observables in terms of their correlations. So, so you, you will do linear transformations uh, of these observables and they will become linear in, independent. Uh, that, Give you an example. <clears throat> okay, here is the example from uh, an earlier work of applying Bayesian analysis. So in this case, this is a uh, correlation between 
V2 and number of charged particles generated from uh, simulations from, I think, maybe two or three hundreds of uh, evaluations, different parameters. So notice that in this case, uh, V2 and the square root of the number of charged particles have these certain correlations. And instead of uh, emulating N charge and V2, you can choose to first emulate along this uh, long axis, which are linear combinations, something like uh, V2 plus uh, number of charged particles uh, as one observables, and also emulate another observables, something like N charge minus V2 along the shorter axis. The great thing about this is that you notice that uh, if you just want the first order approximation, then all you need to emulate is this variation along the, the, the long axis because all this variation along the short axis are small. Or of course, it's not really small in this case, but in most of the cases, you will notice that some of the components only explains or only are only responsible for less than 1% of the total variance. So even if you throw it away, it will, it will not affect it, your, your, your accuracy of emulating individual observables. <clears throat> so in this case, what we are actually doing is that we try to diagonalize the uh, covariance matrix of uh, formed by, by, by these observables when we run them at different input parameter points and try to find a new basis that diagonalize their covariance matrix so that this new variables, lambda one, and lambda two, has a, a more or less linearly independent uh, uh, correlation structures. Uh, of course, this does, does not really decouple nonlinear correlation, nonlinear correlations. For example, the reason that uh, uh, the authors use the square root of n charge instead of n charge is that when you take the square root, you will notice that this distribution looks more or less a multivariate 2D Gaussian distributions, as you can see by the marginalized distributions on the edge of the plot. But if you just use n charge, you can imagine that this distribution will be strongly schooled and give you some like a banana shape. And in this case, uh, of course, you can still perform this procedure, but its performance will be limited by that uh, the distribution itself doesn't really de decouple all of these correlations when you do this transformation. So here is the relative importance of the PCs. Uh, the principal components. So, so in, in, in this plot, I only show two examples. One, you have 20, 70% uh, variance explained by this long axis component. Another one is 28% uh, 20, 28 for higher dimensional problems. For example, in this case, uh, you have uh, 11 observables while you transform it uh, into the PCA space, you have uh, 11 PCs. But you notice that the first one will explain already 50% of all the uh, data's variance. And then the second one explains about 30%. And once you go to the first, it only explains 3%. And from five to 10, they're, they're essentially uh, not, not so important. So that's, so that's how we uh, uh, achieve data re uh, dimensional reduction is that you can uh, drop all these higher order PCs. Uh, in, in, uh, for, uh, and, and only emulate the first five PCs, and then you can, you can do the transformation back to the real physical space to emulate all the uh, observables without a loss of accuracy. In fact, if you do actual simulations, many of these higher order PCs are just pure white noise. Uh, this is because Statistical fluctuations are always independent from any correlations with other observables. So if you do this practice, those white noise fluctuations will always be uh, factored out as an individual independent pieces. And if you do it accurately enough, that in your data you only have a small amount of uh, white noise, they will, <clears throat> they will be uh, uh, treated as independent pieces. So that's also another way uh, to, we will we'll see that's also another way to check one at, at which point your, your PCs are, are going to be dominated by, 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 by noise fluctuations. We will see that uh, in the exercise. 
Okay, so this gives us the final uh, framework for this emulator assisted Bayesian analysis. You start with the parameter space and build the emulators, and you don't have to build the emulators for error observables. You only do it for uh, a few principal components, and then after you you predict each principal components using the emulators, you transform the principal components back into the physical space to make some predictions. And the rest of this is, uh, is all the same. You compare it with experiments using the Bayesian theorem, and you, you define the posterior, and then you use the MCMC to draw samples from the posterior. OK, and now is the last part of the lecture, is that we'll go over the results of a Jetscape Bayesian analysis for shear and bulk viscosities. Oh, okay. there's a question. Is this correct to state that uh, the higher the dimension of parameter space, the better the Gaussian process emulator works? Uh, so it really depends on how, man, how much training data you have, I, I guess. Uh, for example, in one dimension, So in this example, so you, you, I think you can try it yourself, is that you gradually decrease the number of training data. I think for this example, if I get only five or six data points, then the Gaussian process will not be able to have enough information to infer the, this, this ground truth. For two dimension, I think you will need much more training data in order to achieve this. I don't have a mathematical uh, proof for that. It's just some, some uh, to personal experience. So I would say that to go or if you go to higher and higher dimensions, uh, Gaussian process emulator still works, but you will need much more training data. But I don't have a, a, a right answer uh, right right now, like like how how this number of training data scales with the number of dimensions. It's also it also depends on what type of function you you are you are trying to emulate. For example, these two D functions, I built in this very uh, you, you can see there's a, the region uh, where it increases very fast, right? This is actually the region, region where the uncertainty gets large. If you look at the, the bottom left plot, if you look at the top left corner, that's the region where this function changes very fast. So in principle, you can do some, uh, uh, for example, adaptive uh, type of uh, design space sampling that uh, put more data points over here. Uh, but I, I can imagine this will be an even more complicated problem if you go to higher dimensions, that uh, you, you, it's harder to make sure that you, your design is covering, uh, for example, the fast changing part of the function. So, so I would say that go to higher, higher dimension is still more difficult uh, to, 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 to train the emulator. So that's why we do validations. So, so we'll see that uh, after you do this, you can you can sample new data, uh, and then try to try to see uh, how the emulator predictions uh, compares with the uh, uh, the ground truth predictions. If that test passed, then maybe you're you're okay. But before that, you will need uh, definitely more uh, training data for higher dimensions and more complex functions. Okay, so this uh, Jetscape analysis from uh, published last year, uh, we tried to infer all 17 parameters, including the uh, initial condition normalization parameters at two beam energies, and some initial condition related parameters, and free streaming parameters, and eight parameters that parameterize the uh, the, the, the temperature dependencies of the shear and bulk viscosities. And the, uh, here is the, the list of all the observables that we use, or, or you can simply look at the figure on the, on, on the right, which are the charged particle multiplicities, uh, mean PT, Vn, and the uh, mean PT fluctuations. And this left column is the observables at 2.76 TeV, uh, in lead lead collisions, and the red column is the same at uh, gold gold collision at 200 GeV. 
we try to build this likelihood function <clears throat> from the including the uncertainties from both the uh, model emulation, uh, experimental data, and also uh, oh we uh, oh okay so so we we don't have the, the model imperfection right now. So this uh, log likelihood function usually we will just assume that they are multivariate Gaussian because there's no way to to op obtain an analytic uh, uh, likelihood function for such a complex model. So here you have the normalization. The uh, so we have already taken the log. So you have the uh, this bilinear form of uh, 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 this uh, multivariate Gaussian with this uh, delta y being the differences of the experiments minus your predictions. And for this covariance matrix, we try to include uh, both the statistical uncertainties and the systematic uncertainties. They are also uh, correlated experiment uncertainties and uncorrelated the systematic uncertainties. Of course, in this work and exercise, we will only consider all these uncertainties to be uncorrelated. And they will exactly have zero correlation lens. I think more on the exact modeling of uncertainties will be covered uh, by tomorrow's lectures. And this is the MC, uh, samples pulled from MCMC from, from the uh, uh, posterior distributions. And here I only show you, let me see, nine of, out of the seven, uh, 17 parameters that are not related to shear and bulk viscosities. This includes the initial condition parameters, and the free streaming time scales. As for the subplot of the initial condition model, if I, I just focus on, uh, in this case, just the normalization at the two B managers, and also the Trento P parameter, you notice that uh, this P parameter is highly constrained around zero, which means that it highly favors a energy deposition formula proportional to the square root of T A and T B. In this case, it actually really favors this, uh, at least in terms of uh, existing models on the market, this uh, PQCD plus saturation physics, the UKRT model. In this case, their scaling of energy production is precisely, uh, not precisely, but very close to the square root of T A T B. On the other hand, the P equals to one or P equals to minus two third uh, which corresponds to what the nuclear or KL models are strongly disfavored. Of course, you may ask well, what, is the, what is the significance of the square root of TATB. So one explanation that this notice later is that uh, uh, this is actually proportional to the center of mass energy densities of the incoming nuclear matters. So that maybe uh, actually tells us something about how the energy deposition happens in nuclear collisions. Regarding the free streaming time, uh, we don't have much constraints on the exact energy dependencies. So this is already the 90% credible intervals. So first of all, you'll notice that they are not so, uh, so far from the original prior. So we don't have much constraint and it also definitely depends on which type of uh, particularization model that you put in. And you, you don't have a, a good control for whether this uh, free streaming time actually grows or decreases with energy density. Uh, but this is okay. We don't expect all the features of the model to be constrained. Uh, what's important is that we are propagating the uncertainties in the free streaming time into the other part of more interested parameters. So, so this is definitely important. Even though you, you cannot constrain any individual parameters, the uncertainties are included in this manner. Okay, and then we will have a different particularization models. And uh, we can uh, look from the posterior that uh, which one is preferred by the data. Uh, remember that we have tested uh, uh, three types of, uh, three major types of uh, particularization model. Uh, if you look at uh, the uh, legend on the top right, you have the Grad model, the chapman skog model, which are compared in these two plots. And you can see that they definitely produce very different differential observables. Uh, this is because we only, cons uh, we only constrain these uh, parameters using the 
PT integrated observables. So uh, th th there could be differences when you plot PT differential ones. So on all, our question is that uh, whether one can use the data to draw conclusions like uh, which one of this uh, particularization model is preferred by the data. And the, the actually Bayesian methodology provides us such a, a tool to, 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 do this, to do this type of comparison. <clears throat> is that when you have uh, two different type of model, A and B, you can compute the evidence. The evidence is that uh, is just that uh, you integrate the likelihood function times the prior, or basically you, you, you just integrate the, 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 the post, it, it, it's the normalization of the posterior distribution. So, so you can roughly understand this that like what's the, the average likelihood of the model predicting the data, the uh, average over the entire prior space. And you then take the ratio of this uh, to uh, evidence of model A and model B, and you define this base factor of A model A relative to model B. And here you can see that uh, uh, on the figure uh, in, in the bottom left, <clears throat> if you perform this, such a comparison for each of these different methods, you notice that the grad method has a very large base factor relative to the Chapman unscore expansion, 8.2. Also, this is already the logarithmic of the base factor. So a log of uh, B equals to eight really means that the grad model is really strongly favored uh, relative to the Chapman unscore model. The grad model is uh, more or less comparable to this uh, PTB nonlinear modification of the distribution functions. And this PTB method is also strongly favored against uh, the chapman oskoff model. Uh, of course, you can convert this uh, base factors into human language using this, uh, uh, usually people use this interpolation, in, interpretation over here. If you have a base factor uh, greater than two, <clears throat> a log of base factor greater than two, then you can see that uh, the evidence is of A is better than B is decisive. Uh, if it's a log of a log of the base factor is one to two, you have a strong evidence to to have model A preferable over B and and and, and so on. And then this way you, you can quote these numbers into what we we think of as uh, whether one model is statist is statistically supported to be favorable than the other. And now if we have all these different type of uh, models and uh, we don't just want to quote whether one model is better than another, we just want to forget about uh, we have chosen these three different models. And what we, we want to ask is that if we have these uncertainties in the model, what will be the final posteriors of the shear and bulk viscosities? In this case, the problem uh, becomes something like this. You have a list of models, each have their own evidences, and posterior. And in this case, you can use the Bayesian model averaging technique called BMA to define a final posterior averaging over different choice of models. So in this case, you just uh, weighted the posterior of each model by their evidence. In this way, you define the so-called Bayesian model averaged posterior. And that's how we obtain the final posterior of the QGP viscosities. In this, let, let, let's go to, there, there are many bands in this figure. Let's go to them one by one. So if you look at this uh, blue, red, and green boxes, open, all, all, all open band, they are individual models. Of course, in this case, you'll notice that uh, uh, the chapman Unskov really prefers a smaller bulk viscosity and smaller shear viscosities, while the chapman Unskov, uh, sorry, while the grad, grad method and PTB method prefer slightly larger shear and bulk viscosities. However, when we do the Bayesian model averaging, because they are weighted by the uh, evidence, and we know that uh, the chapman unskov provides you the least evidence in this averaging, so the average the results, the BMA, the, the, which is the orange band, uh, it's, it's actually dominated by the, the grad method, which, is which gives you the, the largest evidence. And in this case, we can quote this BMA posterior as the 
new posterior that has taken into account some uncertainties in the particleization stage. Okay, uh, in the last few minutes, I will just stress a few points in this analysis that uh, was to make a remark. The first one is the importance of prior. So this is just a, a very simple example. I think it's from a flip coin, is that if you have a, a flat prior and you have a likelihood function that goes like this green curve, then posterior is just the, the product of the two. Of course, depending on your assumption of the prior, this uh, posterior and your likelihood functions doesn't have really have to agree, especially when you have a strong belief that, uh, for example, this x variable is uh, tightly peaked around 0.4, even your likelihood function peaked around 0.7, your posterior is still going to be dominated by the prior. So how does this reflect in more complicated analysis is that uh, uh, when you have a much flexible prior, you are allowing for more possible cases to be tested in your analysis. In this case, we have four parameters each for shear and bulk viscosities. Uh, in this case, this parameterization, including uh, for the bulk viscosities, you have uh, the peak, is parameterized by the peaking temperatures and the peaking values. And you have the width and the symmetries below of the width, uh, below and above these peaking temperatures. For the viscosity, for the shear viscosities, you have a kink, or we will parameterize a kink at, a temp, uh, at certain temperatures uh, with uh, some kink values. And you have two uh, slopes be uh, below and above the, the kink, kink temperatures. So in this case, this, this prompt transition gives you quite large degree of flexibilities. And when you vary A, B, C, uh, sorry, this, uh, each of these four parameters in the prompt transition independently, you get the prior range that looks like this. Of course, when you have a more flexible uh, 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 prompt transitions, you can try to fix one of them in order to obtain a more constrictive, a more, more, more more restrictive uh, prior. In this case, we can fix one of the parameters in each of these parameterization, and the prior range is reduced. Um, so the result is that if you use a more restrictive prior, your posterior is also changed. This is just the same idea as basically the same as this. If you use a flat prior versus a restricted prior, your posterior can change by a lot. This is also what we find in this case for shear viscosities. So on the left, you will see two bands. Uh, the solid band is the posterior used in the full prior used in the jet skip analysis. And this uh, dashed band, uh, uh, the dashed boxes are the more restrictive prior. It's restrictive in the sense that uh, it uh, resembles what is used in the earlier work on the right. So, so in this case, we understand that why this earlier analysis gives you more uh, stronger temperature dependencies as is seen in this jet skip analysis. It really comes from that uh, the prior range of the two, these two analyses are different. And once you include a more general prior, you have less constraint on, uh, not constraint, you have uh, less temperature dependent features in the extracted shear and bulk viscosities. So, so this is just a, a lesson that we learned that it's really important to examine your prior before you do the patient analysis, especially for this function effect, because a function in principle has the infinitely man, many degrees of freedom. And even we are including four parameters for every one of them, it's still a quite a restrictive prior. So, in the future, especially for this functional analysis, I think one improvement that one should consider is to think about the general sets of prior that is suitable for functional analysis. Nevertheless, even we have a quite restrictive prior right now, we can still try to uh, separate what is already parameterized in the prior versus what we can actually learn from the data. 
for example, in this case, uh, this, this, this practice tells us sometimes, uh, the, for example, if you look at bulk viscosity, the smallness of the bulk viscosity at high temperature is not really what we learned from the data, it's actually what we parameterized in the prior. So is there a way to separate these two effects uh, and, 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 and to quantify what is actually learned in the data? So that is to compute the information gain of the posterior relative to the prior. So, so, so this is just to uh, compute how much uh, exper experimental data provides constraint to modify the posterior relative to the prior. So in this case, we can actually use the so-called uh, KL divergence to define the distances between two distributions. So in this case, the KL divergence is the distance between two distributions. We will, we will take P1 to be the posterior distribution and P2 to be the prior distribution. And uh, then they're actually defining this uh, something look like entropy, but it's not exactly entropy. Uh, it's positive. And it also have the properties of the distances uh, that if this difference is larger than one, uh, sorry, larger than zero, that means that the posterior is very different from what you parameterized in the prior. If this thing is zero, then it means that the posterior is, isn't too far from the post prior. And this is what we compute as the uh, KL divergence for shear and bulk viscosities at each temperatures. <laughs> You notice that although the, the the posterior of the zeta over s shows this some kind of a decrease at high temperatures, but they really are not far from the prior. And if you compute the KL divergence, there it's almost zero above 250 MeV temperatures. So it means that you you do have some features over here at high temperatures, but uh, you are just plotting your prior. What is actually learned. Or, or information gained from the experimental data is really those values at low temperatures. In this case, uh, you have the most information gain around 170 MeV. On the right, it's the same story for shear, uh, for shear viscosities. Most of the information gain is below 250 MeV. While in high temperatures, you may see some features, but that's what really you have already parameterized in the prior. So by computing information again, even though we are using quite restrictive prior right now, uh, you can still uh, try, try, try to identify the effect of the prior and the effect of data. Okay, uh, so the last point is the cold effect. Uh, as the, the question that people just asked is that, uh, how do you know that uh, you have enough uh, training data points for the Gaussian emulators, then in that case, one way to test if your Gaussian emulator is working properly is to try to uh, make new predictions and see if the, the emulator's prediction agrees with the ground truth. Uh, we can also perform this idea for the whole Bayesian, um, uh, the Bayesian analysis framework is that uh, instead of using experimental data, you can generate pseudo data with your model, given a set of parameters as the ground truth. And let's see if you can use your Bayesian workflow to infer this truth uh, by calibrating to the suit data. This is actually a what we call the perfect model scenario because we are assuming that uh, the data are generated from models. So there's no uh, model imperfection of certainties. But it's still very useful to perform such a, a, a practice because it, it really tells you how good you, your analysis can perform in the best case scenario. And this is also what we did in the JetScape analysis. In this case, we just put in some, some truth function for eta over s and zeta over s as the dashed line and generate a set of pseudo data by running the model using this uh, shear and bulk viscosities and to see if our Bayesian analysis can uh, infer uh, the, uh, the posterior distribution close enough to the truth. And generally, it uh, it, it works. Of course, it, you, you really have to take this 90% credible interval and 90%, 60% credible interval uh, seriously. So not all of the truth has to lie within the 60% credible interval. Sometimes it can even go out of the 90%. 
so 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 what you are getting here is really a this statistical conclusion again at high, at high temperatures it always lies in within the band is because we you really don't have much constraint over here and of course all of the truths will be lie in within our uh, prior distribution okay uh, I will skip this uh, two point because we will uh, somehow cover it in the in the hands-on session. Okay, so in summary, uh, with the Bayesian methodology, we are seeing the paradigm shift in drawing statistically robust conclusions from complex model and uh, a global experimental data. Especially, we can propagate the model uncertainties from different parts of the model to the quantities that we are interested and uh, extract their information with uh, basically we, we, we can interpret them with uh, statistically robust uh, uh, conclusions. And for complex models, we really need machine learning techniques to make them doable. This including this includes the uh, principle of component analysis to do, to do data reduction so that you can handle high uh, dimensional vector like output. And we often also use a supervised learning like a Gaussian, Gaussian model emulators in order to speed up the, the process of making predictions at a new input point. And I have shown you this example of extracting shear and bulk viscosities using the Jetscape multi stage bulk evolution models and show how the uncertainties from initial conditions uh, propagates into shear viscosity and also from different model choices, those the particleization model choices can be propagated. To viscosities using Bayesian model averaging. And this, finally, I want to stress that uh, prior distribution is extremely important, especially for functional quantities. And sometimes, even though we are still not uh, completely solving this prior problem for functional quantities, you can, you can still compute something like the information again in order to see what is actually constrained by the data versus what is already parameterized in the prior. Okay. I, I will say let's take some questions and then we'll have a break before we have the hands-on session. Oh, I see. Uh, okay. So, I guess if there's no question right now, uh, let's let's take. Uh, well, let's meet at uh, eight. Sir, uh, sorry, what is the? Uh, so it's, a, it's 30 minutes after. <laughs> yes. So I, I don't know what's the 1030, right? Your your time is 1030. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's 17 after the hour. We could restart it at half past. Right? Yeah. So, or 18 after. So basically in about 10 minutes, 10 or 